should not ever take hormone supplementation. You should never take hormone supplementation because you are blindly guessing at doses that are only accurate for very brief moments throughout your day. If you put a cream on or you're taking a pill because you're short of this or that at 9 a.m. when you took your blood work test or your saliva test, that cream is putting out doses that aren't even accurate from the get-go, but throughout the day when your body's adjusting your hormone levels probably 50 times a day, it's totally off. You're going up and down in your cycles in very precise, precise manner, and you're blindly putting a cream on there and hoping that it fills some gap there. And I'm just telling you that doesn't work. Hormone supplementation is not a good idea. Um, so the same concept is true with retinoic acid. Incredible, just like your hormones are incredible, but yet let the body figure out the timing of it. And that's what's so perfect about retinaldehyde. You see, retinaldehyde doesn't have a toxic event. Retinaldehyde's design is to be the source for retinoic acid. When the body needs retinoic acid, it goes and grabs retinaldehyde because it's not hurting anything, it's not interfering with wound healing in any way, and it turns it into retin-A in one step. That's why retinaldehyde exists. And we keep it in our fat, you all have it, you're full of it right now. Not that you're extra fat, I'm just kidding, it's in your fat. Um, but you have plenty of retinaldehyde, and that turns into retin-A whenever the skin wants. So if you apply it topically, the skin's gonna say, oh yeah, I can turn it into a retin-A right now, or it's gonna say, no, let's go put it in the fat. And you let your skin, you give it the best tool that you could have, and you let it go. If you put retinal palmitate on the skin, it creates irritation at the epidermal level, and it goes in and it gets stored for the next time you go into sun. Doesn't make collagen, never did. So my challenge was, when I was making cosmetics, I was using retinol. It was called L-retinol A or whatever, but it was just retinols, mostly uh, trans retinol. And trans retinol is fine, but it doesn't make collagen. Never does. Makes retinol palmitate, makes retinol acetate, but it doesn't go on to make it. Now, maybe in dire straits, if you're out of retinaldehyde, a few of those molecules go ahead and go. But what they found in the research was that retinols are a thousand times weaker a thousand times weaker in making collagen because the body just doesn't use them for that. So all the retinols, even when vitamin A is important, vitamin A is good for the skin. Your skin uses these retinols. I don't know what retinol acetate is serving a purpose for at the moment, but it uses them just in different ways. And the reason we're taking them and applying them is to make collagen. So let's use the right tools. And that's why retinaldehyde is important. That's why stabilized retinaldehyde is important. Um, and that's why liposome delivered retinol that is important because all these retinols are big molecules and they don't make it into the skin and if you have a delivery system, great, that'll help. But here's your challenge because I know you've got several dermal needle lovers in the room and you're thinking, ah, if I poke a hole, that big old retinol is going to fit its way through and that's a yes, no to answer that question. You see, when you wound the skin with a deep needle, you get better penetration, but now your skin is in repair mode. So it's sloughing all the damaged skin and pushing it off. So now it's taking that big retinol, it's like an umbrella sitting in there, and it's getting caught up in a slough. So yes, you got it to deep go into the epidermis better, but you didn't get it to the dermis because the net gain wasn't there because you created a wound. That's the secret. So we have this device called Resenerate, which only cracks the surface of the stratum corneum when it's used right, you couldn't be too aggressive with it, but we teach not to. Uh, and so now you're just breaking the stratum corneum enough to get the retinol in without creating this huge wound in the deeper layers that causes that whole churning and moving everything out. That is, uh, you know, and again, I didn't invent that device, I just found I'm like, that makes sense to me. So that's, that's how we differentiate between dermal needling and something called Resenerate. Um, so there you go, so that's the retinol story. So again, every retinol you're using, particular retinoic acid, oh my God, the damage the retinoic acid does to your epidermis is horrendous. It's actually why it works. Believe it or not, obviously you say, oh, but I was using your Aunt May and my fine lines got better. What, what was that? It literally causes swelling and scar tissue buildup, this, this protein called mucin builds up in your epidermis. Your epidermis stops creating keratinous uh, uh, corneocytes. Your keratinocytes get frozen in some, in some maturation process. All this is research proven. And, and, and so your whole epidermis is mangled, and sometimes your fine lines look better when that happens. So 
that, you can see an explanation for everything. I always challenge me with that. Like, but wait a minute, why do I see a result with that? So we're going to go through a few of these ingredients. You're like, well, why did I see a result with that? Vitamin C. I'm a big believer in vitamin C. Vitamin C is key for one fancy term called hydroxylation. A lot of you think vitamin C's magic happens as an antioxidant. That is mostly not true. Its role as an antioxidant is not key. The key antioxidants in your body are glutathione, um, uh, uh, catalase, uh, superoxide dismutase. Those are some of the key ones that are really protecting you from the oxygen-free radicals. Vitamin C's primary role is to oh, <coughs> vitamin C's primary role is to make your amino acids sticky. And when it does this process right there, they get sticky, one sticks to the next one, sticks to the next one, and now your chain of collagen begins, okay? So how do we get vitamin C to come back around? Glutathione. Glutathione is this tiny little antioxidant. Your body can make it really, really fast. It's easy to make. The amino acid chain is pretty easy to make. Vitamin C you can't make. Vitamin C has to come from your diet or you get scurvy where your sticky skin starts to fall apart and break apart, right? Makes sense? So that is the role of vitamin C. So why I'm telling you this is vitamin C has a penetration problem and vitamin C has an epidermal damage problem. Too much vitamin C hurts your epidermis. So there's a fine line on how much vitamin C you should use. We figured out a way to use a little bit less and use another molecule called alpha-ketoglutarate which also does the thing called hydroxylation. Not nearly as harsh on the skin. So you'll find in our products, we're using a combination of vitamin C and alpha-ketoglutarate so that we're doing the least amount of wounding to your skin with the highest pre presentation of hydroxylating ingredients. So there's a science to that, uh, to that uh, process. And, um, and when you use 10%, it's right on the edge. Uh, when you use anything over than 10%, you're definitely starting to get into wounding phase. You see the plumping, you'll see the lines that do it. Um, the other thing that's tricky about vitamin C, because I get this in this debate a lot, because, oh my gosh, you guys have been completely trained that you better not be using oxidized vitamin C, and it just doesn't work. But I, have, I want you to think about it. So what you're telling me then is when your C becomes oxidized, that it never works again. And yet, remember... As soon as you hydroxylate an amino acid in your skin, your C is now oxidized. What do we know about that C? It gets recycled. It turns out your C's get recycled about 100 different times. So if you use high, uh, um, oxidized C on the surface of your skin, glutathione will fix it 99 more times once it gets down to the de dermis. So that's the secret of vitamin C. It's not about oxidation. In fact, their studies show oxidized C penetrates a little better. I don't prefer it per se because it also is a little more irritating on its way down. But in general, you should know that you're getting 99% of the activity when you put a C on that's already been oxidized. It's not really a problem. And we see that in our results because we have uh, oxidation happening in our products and they're extremely active. You'll see broken capillaries disappear, acne scarring improved by as much as 50, 60%. You know, lots of really exciting uh, skin tags fall off. Sometimes moles fall off. Lots of really cool repair happening. Doesn't matter necessarily that the C is oxidized. But important to remember that C is a critical part. You should have that in your regimen every day. Oxygen. So challenging, oxygen. Because like so many things in your body, the perfect amount is incredible. You know, newborns, young, our children have this incredible amount of oxygen. Their lungs are filled with it. Their bodies are small. They're they're distributing it incredibly well. Their bodies use it. But here's the thing to remember about oxygen. The most amazing repair tool, the most amazing activator of cellular activation, uh, of processing, of making your cells function healthy, but also when it gets turns into a free radical, a source of damage. So it's one of those things that you should not be trying to balance because only your body knows how to balance it. When your body sends an oxygen up from the dermis to the epidermis, a free, a, an antioxidant bodyguard is sent with it. This whole concept of oxygen therapy on the face or through the nostrils, that's all uh, damaging, damaging to the lungs. We knew this when I was in residency and I'd be in the pediatric ICU and you'd be giving these little kids who are struggling to breathe oxygen through their nose and what do they end up with? 
scarring of their lungs. Because oxygen is good, too much oxygen is bad. The same thing is happening when you do it on the skin level. Now again, there's things that happen physiologically that make us think they're better. When you put oxygen on your face, your face says too much oxygen, and the first thing it does is it constricts your blood vessels, because that's its source of oxygen. And all of a sudden, red things look less red. And you're like, man, I just took away inflammation. No, you just caused this physiologic response called vasoconstriction. So that's oxygen. But the important thing to remember about oxygen is O2, not stable. O2 turns into a free radical. Hydrogen peroxide, benzyl peroxide, they turn into free radicals almost instantly. They are not stable in your skin. They shouldn't be up in your epidermis. You're getting free radical damage every time you use them. What we discovered, and I'll say again, I put the intention out there, I'm like, what is it I need in order to fix this problem? And I was introduced to a gentleman who had basically figured out this molecule called trioxalane. And trioxalane is totally stable. The sun doesn't turn it into a free radical. And when you put it on your skin, your skin uses it just like it's supposed to, to fix wounds. Because you can imagine, oxygen is so strong. Remember we learned how it's like so strong and it rips cell walls apart and it rips apart other parts of your skin. Well, that's a powerful energetic force. That's oxygen, powerful. Well, that same power is why your skin uses oxygen to fix things. It doesn't just tear them apart. They also use oxygen to powerfully pull that cell wall back together. So you need oxygen in your system. That's why exercise is so critical. You see all these studies about getting you know, 20, 30 minutes a day now. Very true. I mean, we need that level in our system. Again, when I'm exercising and bringing all that oxygen into my system, my body's putting it in the right places. It's using it for the right things. If I try to take oxygen in some, I don't know, I got used to do those cans of oxygen and stuff. You know, none of that was really doing much. I guess, you know, maybe an oxygen can had so little oxygen it wasn't a big deal. But bottom line is on the skin level, oxygen is cold and controlled by vasoconstriction and vasodilation and new blood vessel formation. So every year of your adult life, you have 1% less blood supply going to your skin. So we have to address that. That was one of the key parts of my aging realization is that if I don't increase blood vessel um, delivery and or formation, I can't really make the skin better because you cannot, you can't take someone who's nutrition deprived, put them in the gym and get them to bulk their muscles up because they don't have the nutrition to feed that process. Same thing is true with the skin. I can't say skin, make me a whole bunch of collagen if I'm not feeding the process at the same time. So oxygen is partially to do with that. The other thing that oxygen is critical for is ATP production. The more oxygen you have, the more ATP is made in your cells. The more ATP, the more everything else works better. ATP is the second most important substance in your body next to oxygen. And it is what drives every reaction. So when you meet someone and they're kind of depressed, chances are they're not making enough serotonin. And the reason why they're not making enough serotonin is they don't have enough ATP. One of the reasons why, why people are addicted to running is because they so fully oxygenate their system that their serotonin levels and all their neurotransmitters are at a maximum level of production. They feel good. You know, I know we talk about endorphins, but it's really about the entire system operating at a much higher level. It's just oxygen. We know this. We know. In fact, oxygen is what makes cholesterol go down. Because when you churn, you create enough oxygen, your body starts using that fat. The reason why we have high cholesterol is we're not using the fat. So you can eat less fat, and some people see a reduction in their cholesterol, or you can tell your cells to crank it up a notch. And so, um, again, I put the intention out there. I met a gentleman who had invented a way to increase the production of ATP. It's a product called Elevate. It's phenomenal. Clinical trials are phenomenal on it. I think I have a slide on it. But, um, you know, clinical trials show it burned 1.6 pounds of fat a month without changing their exercise patterns. That it... Um, lower cholesterol and triglycerides better than statin drugs, that it improved energy levels and neurotransmitters. It helps people with anxiety because they don't make enough GABA. It helps people with depression because they don't make enough serotonin. So it's one of those ones where you're just, again, you give the body the tools, it's a cellular target, and the body will take it and it knows what to do with it. Again, there's a consciousness in the body that says, I know what to do with this. I know exactly what to do with it. And sometimes you'll give somebody a tool, and you're like, why didn't it fix that problem? Because it's being used for something else. You can't second guess why some people don't respond. Like sometimes um, our melasma cases don't get better. I don't know 
what that is. Sometimes it's because they're fixing their joints or some other part of their body.